the mic. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome very much to this session uh, on managing migration, in which uh, we will be, as we do, it feels to me like at every Fabian's conference, try to set out um, an immigration policy for the left um, that will command public confidence and popular support. And it's um, perhaps unlike um, many previous Fabian's conferences where I've um, spoken at or chaired this particular session, um, perhaps not the top political issue of the day, but I think we all know that it is one on which Labour traditionally has found the territory quite rocky. Um, and I think we should take advantage of the fact that the spotlight is not on this policy area at the moment to try and think creatively about what our policies and ambition should look like. Um, I'm really very grateful that um, we have the support of the European Parliament and FEPS for this uh, conference today, because as we have been saying throughout the day, the challenges that we're facing for all that we've now left the European Union are challenges we want to face with our European friends and neighbours. And in relation to asylum and migration, we cannot achieve meaningful policies unless we are working with our closest neighbours and friends. And I'm absolutely delighted, a brilliant panel to speak to us today, uh, three on the stage, one I'm hoping on the screen subject to technology. Um, but I wanted to start by saying again how very sad we are that Jack Dromey, who should have been on the panel this afternoon, is not with us. Jack, in the short time that he served as the Shadow Immigration Minister, had been doing an outstanding job with a particularly nasty piece of legislation and a as I, as I know you all know, always a difficult brief. Um, but I am delighted that in his place we have his immediate predecessor, Bambus Charolambos. Uh, Bambus has served both um, as a Shadow Home Office Minister with responsibility for migration and is now in the Shadow Foreign Office team. Uh, so I think that's a very good read across for us, uh, Bambus, to have you address us today. Um, I will introduce the other speakers as we come to them uh, through the course of the event. We'll hear from each of the speakers for about five minutes each. I hope there'll be lots of time for questions and comments. Uh, we'll then have a, a very short roundup comment from each of the speakers, uh, and we will finish the session at a quarter to four. So, Bambos, may I invite you to kick us off, please? And we're absolutely delighted you're here to speak to us today. Uh, thank you, Kate, and it's a real pleasure to be here uh, to be able to speak to the Fabian Society. Uh, the conference is always amazing, so it's a real pleasure to be uh, on the panel for the first time. Um, I had the um, uh, misfortune of being the Shadow Minister uh, for the uh, really pernicious Borders Bill that the Tories have introduced uh, in order to punish people on how they arrive in the UK seeking protection, which is a clear breach of our international responsibilities. Uh, and what this points to is the knee-jerk reaction from the Tories uh, in trying to deal with um, the issue of not migration, but actually just um, the visual of people crossing the channel in boats, because we've got a situation whereby um, the uh, the Home Office is very happy to give uh, BNO visas to people from Hong Kong. Uh, in the new plan for uh, immigration, they say they're very happy to have potentially 5 million people from Hong Kong to come to the UK under these BNO visa schemes. Um, but um, 26,000 uh, people crossing the channel uh, is an abomination to them because it gives them bad press. Uh, and this shows the actual fundamentals of what's wrong with the problem. So not stressing the problem, it's a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, and this has been, uh, as a uh, partly what was behind Brexit, but also partly what's uh, behind uh, what they're doing at the moment. And it's not working. Um, it's not working because um, they, they've introduced the highly skilled workers point scheme, but it's winding up businesses. Businesses uh, who need workers are finding it bureaucratic and it's not dealing with the problem. We've had uh, lots of people, lots of businesses who are complaining about the um, the worker shortage. Um, on the 24th of December, on Christmas Eve, the Tories announced that people in social care would now be in the worker shortage scheme and would be allowed to get visas to come to work in the UK. They delayed saying that for ages and ages, all of a sudden they changed tack. It's not just them, it's also agriculture workers. I met with the NFU. Uh, if you look, look at the uh, British Chamber of Commerce, visit their website, they're also complaining about this. So they're not 
immigration is not working for business. And I think that's a great opportunity for us to uh, get in and actually show that we're listening to the needs of business and make migration going to work for that. The, the, the scheme is broken, the immigration system is broken. Uh, we have a situation where um, over 48% of uh, appeals for asylum are overturned, uh, sorry, are successful uh, after first decision. That shows the system is not working. Uh, the brilliant journalist May Borman from The Independent on an FOI request found that uh, there were 399 people that were waiting for over 10 years for their asylum claim to be processed. And that is an absolute scandal. But it's not just that, it's also people who uh, are here legally and um, are applying for leave to remain. The delays in making leave to remain, which you need to actually lawfully work because of the Immigration Act uh, 2014, they've taken a long time. So those people are unable to work because of the incompetence and inefficiency um, of the system that's taking place. So we need to address those issues. We need to make sure we have an efficient asylum system that works, that actually processes claims within um, six months. Uh, we need to have a system that is uh, uh, fair, that people um, can say it is a fair system and it, it does deliver and it's efficient and it's humane as well. So these are things we need to look at. We also need to look at uh, issues around um, the the shortage is another it is so one of the things i'd be quite keen to look at is a youth mobility scheme which would have a two-year visa that would, an international visa that would allow people to come to the uk and work and fill the gaps in areas like hospitality uh, where we actually do have uh, big problems in recruiting people uh, and the other things that we need to look at are also areas in relation to um, family reunion routes because that's a huge problem that's seen as a draw people will make dangerous crossings uh, if there are no family reunion routes and also need to make sure there are safe legal routes for people to actually come to the UK. Um, I'm, and I'm going to be out of time very briefly and I hope I can answer some questions. I'll try to pack in as much as I can. But unless we have these measures in place and unless we're actually proud to speak about immigration, and I'm not talking about uh, immigration mugs that we had in the 2015 election, we need to be clear uh, and loud and proud about immigration because we would all benefit from it. Uh, I haven't even had a chance to talk about demographics. We are all going to be older. We will need a younger um, workforce to actually uh, make sure that we are cared for in, in the future. Those are some of the topics that I've uh, I've touched on. Uh, there's so much more I could say, but uh, I think I'll stop there. Otherwise, I'll be out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bernice. Thank you for getting us off to a great start and sticking within the five minute time scale and there will be lots of opportunity to pick up on the issues that you've only been able to touch on so far. Now I'm hoping through a miracle of technology that our next speaker will be joining us online, Amreen Pareshi, yes excellent, uh, who is a researcher with IPPR North uh, working across the migration trade and communities team and she's also um, a member of the NEON Spokesperson Network. Um, Amreen, we're really delighted to have you join us, if not in person, at least in uh, cyberspace. I'm very much looking forward to what you have to say. It's going to be harder for me to control uh, Amreen's five minutes, so I'm going to have to rely on goodwill and self-discipline, but we're very keen to, to hear from you over the next few minutes. Great. So I'm going to spend my five minutes to discuss um, what I, I think our migration system should ideally look like. And I'm going to base this conversation around some of the work that IPPR has done um, last year on the hostile environment. And the reason why I'm going to base this discussion on the hostile environment is because the immigration measures that came under the hostile environment, or what's now known as the compliant environment policy, um, is really a reflection of critical policy failure within the Home Office and also a reflection on the direction immigration policies are currently heading towards um, with the upcoming Nationality and Borders Bill. Um, so to just give you a very brief overview of what the hostile environment is, it's a series of immigration checks, uh, immigration immigration charges and data sharing practices that have been put in place essentially to deter people who don't have immigration status in the country to leave on their own accord. But our research has shown that this policy isn't very effective. Um, the number of people that have voluntarily, uh, that are meant to have voluntarily have left because of these th this policy has actually decreased over the years. We know that the hostile environment policies have fostered racial discrimination, it's driven people to destitution, and it's led to the erroneous deportation of black British citizens who had every right to live in the UK, as we saw with the Windrush scandal. So this shameful chapter in British history wouldn't have happened if the hostile environment policy essentially wasn't in place. So in our work, we call for an overhaul of um, our immigration system with the hopes that if these reforms take place, 
It will lead to a progressive um, migration system where people can exercise their right to seek protection, live and work in the UK and be able to do that with dignity. Um, so we think that there needs to be some serious uh, changes to checks, charges and data sharing. So that means legislative reform that will repeal the right to rent checks and other key parts of the hostile environment. Also reforming the right to work checks and introducing a new legislation to prevent the sharing of immigration data between public services and the Home Office. And this would essentially help to deliver a major transformation in the government's approach to immigration enforcement and end a number of uh, discriminatory practices. Um, in terms of home office reform, the culture within the home office needs to desperately change because a lot of their policies right now are based on ideology and are not really based on, on much evidence-based thinking. So reforms need to take place to make sure that there is an evidence-based non-discriminatory approach to immigration enforcement. Um, and that means carrying out impact assessments to make sure um, that po policies aren't disproportionately impacting people of color. It also means carrying out um, uh, panels and consultations with people that have a direct experience of migration. And it also means um, making sure that there's effective scrutiny of certain immigration practices. And by doing so, this will not only help improve the reputation of the Home Office, but it will also help um, improve the operational effectiveness of the department too. And finally, we think that there should be improved routes to regularization. So that means that the current routes that we have, they need to be desperately simplified. That means developing a system with clear routes to secure um, indefinite leave to remain and um, you can have a simplified route for people that have been living in the UK for long periods of time um, but haven't been able to obtain their status you can also potentially have a simplified route for people that are facing vulnerable situations so people that have been subjected to exploitation or abuse can um, can um, access um, um, the ability to obtain status safely so a restructure is really essential to make sure that um, people can access um, these services safely and also be able to navigate our, um, our very excessively bureaucratic system um, with ease um, and be able to essentially exercise their right to live work and seek protection in the UK with dignity. Um, I don't know if I have much time left, but just a few remarks on the British uh, on on the on the channel crossings. Um, I, I think it's really important that there is better collaboration between the French and the UK authorities, and that and we've seen recently that both the both the UK and France have been at loggerheads at, um, with each other, trying to pass the buck on who's responsible for the people crossing the channel. Um, but the reality is that people will continue to cross the channel if there aren't any safe and legal routes and that seriously needs to be addressed. If there were safe and legal routes, it will significantly reduce the number of tragic deaths that we've seen recently. And I'm happy to touch on that more later on in discussion. And um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Henri. I think already with just the first two presentations, we can see what a, a vastly wide policy territory uh, this is uh, that we're covering in this session. And, and so I'm delighted now to turn to our next speaker, um, Professor Tom Brooks, who has a very wide grasp of the subject and, and, and as many of you will know, speaks and writes um, at length on it. Tom's a professor of law and government uh, at Durham University. He's just stepped down at the end of his term as Dean of the Law School at Durham University. So he's a free agent, <laughs> right. um, except when we take up his time as a member of the Fabian's Executive Committee. And we're very pleased to have you as an exec member, Tom. And delighted to, that you're here to speak to us this afternoon. You're always so kind. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, there's an awful lot I can say, and I won't say it all. Uh, I'm an immigrant, uh, so I speak about something I know about firsthand. This is not just a matter of academic study for me. I've gone through, I've taken the test. Um, and one of the things that I would kind of say to kind of start my brief remarks would be what one of the things I think that characterizes a lot of the, uh, the, the Tories' position on immigration has been incompetence and mixed with ignorance. For example, we heard an awful lot about how they're going to launch a points-based immigration system, not knowing it was launched in 2008. In case they, uh, when, when it, we got around to trying to remind them through the Migration Advisory Committee, an independent uh, body, the chair was not renewed, uh, did not have his, his term uh, extended as he had hoped, as he says in the letter in comments to the government on how they could start a points-based system, saying that the system the government wanted was largely already in place. When the government committed itself, the Tory government, to trying to reduce net migration 
we saw the highest net migration in British history. When they said that they were going to uh, have the most removals, they were going to, going to really focus on throwing folks out in hostile environment, we actually saw removals go to the lowest level in history. The hostile environment was a total disaster in more ways than just its uh, than ethical questions. Uh, little pop quiz. How many people were exposed living in the UK unlawfully through the bank checks in the hostile environment? Answers none. No one was exposed. In fact, it wasn't the purpose of exposing new people. It was really about seeing if the folks the Home Office thought were here unlawfully were still here unlawfully or not. Uh, sham marriages was something else the government wanted to tackle. It's one of its big ideas was the ex-spousal report form, where you would download a Word document from gov.uk and say you're not subsisting with someone. Does anyone know how many forms were actually handed into the Home Office since about 2015 when it was launched? The answer is none. None were actually received as of at least a few months ago. And then you, of course, have a citizenship test to, in order to become a permanent resident or become a citizen that has become a test that very few British citizens seem able to pass. Okay. So, so one thing that I would uh, recommend very warmly uh, to my party is that we think about immigration policy as, as something competent. When we say we want to do things that we deliver on them, and to run through a kind of a quick list of just a couple points, one would be to have proper exit checks to kind of properly secure the border. The way the government finds out that I'm that an American is going to New York and a British citizen is coming back, one, they don't look at dual nationality uh, for a start. The second is they want the airline to tell them. They don't actually check and keep that uh, independent data. There's a big issue around business uh, uh, that has struggled. The points-based system that the Tories were trying to reform and, 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 and launch in their eyes was supposed to make things easier, supposed to make things better and it has made things less flexible. There's a real price on love uh, that I think is in family reunion, I think that we should push very hard as well. It's wrong uh, that it, you know, it matters what the British citizen in a partnership is earning in order to bring a spouse and children to be in their country. Uh, this is another uh, big problem. And then a final point, because I'm being mindful of the time, Chair, uh, as always, to, to comment briefly on the English uh, Channel crossings. There's a reason why I think we've seen the crossings be about this level for many, many decades, and then a spiking about two years ago. And part of the answer here is that we left the Dublin regulation, that we're not part in, in Brexit, that was something missing. And when colleagues were asking uh, parliamentary questions in the, in the uh, Commons, there was a kind of an arrogance about, oh, well, we're going to be independent, we'll do our own fun thing, it'll all be glorious. But when Lord Rosser asked in the House of Lords, we got a different answer, saying that the government was actually trying to incorporate the Dublin regulation as part of the Brexit agreement, but at the last bit just gave up on that. And the fact that now folks coming across can't be extradited anywhere in the European Union, because there's no longer extradition treaties, surely takes away um, uh, kind of a key part of the uh, cooperation and partnership that we have uh, with our European allies. And that doesn't make anyone safer or improve, as Keir Starmer was saying earlier this morning, our collective national well being. I'll stop there. Thank there'll, be, you. there'll be more opportunities. <laughs> sure. Indeed. Thank you ever so much, Ken. Um, and I think we're getting some real common themes now about just the fact that whatever the government's moral purpose, and we certainly can have a poor opinion of that, their practical competence uh, can really be called into question. And I think it'll be interesting when we come to the open session to explore whether we think that's fruitful political territory for us as much mm. as it's obvious uh, policy territory. So I'm delighted now to turn to our final panel speaker, um, Heather Staff. Mm. Heather, 
is a specialist policy advisor on immigration and asylum, uh, working for the RAMP project. Um, and Heather's particular role in that project is to support Labour parliamentarians who are working on immigration and asylum policy. And I can speak from absolute first-hand experience uh, for how good Heather is at that job, since she did it in my office uh, for the best part of two years. She's also uh, very recently, and much to my delight, um, the selected candidate for Labour in the Islington South Ward of uh, Laycock. And uh, in addition is the current chair of Elsa, the Labour campaign for international development, and Cottle Christians on the left, of which she is secretary. So we're very lucky to have Heather here uh, today as our final speaker this afternoon. Great, thanks, Kate. Try not to shake too much. <laughs> In response to the Windrush review, uh, Priti Patel said her ambition was to build a fairer, more compassionate Home Office that puts people first and sees the face behind the case. I think the Home Secretary and I have a very different view of compassion. Instead, we've got a rushed work of fiction, Nationality and Borders Bill, that would put more people in danger. It costs shunts destitution onto local authorities, rides roughshed over international law, and fails to offer any safe and regular routes. We've got a Windrush compensation scheme that really doesn't compensate a points-based system that my fellow panellists have referred to that is inflexible and expensive and a ridiculously expensive citizenship process. And although, like my fellow panellists, I welcome the Hong Kong VNO scheme, it still leaves those born after 1997 who are often most in need of asylum and protection without a route to safety. The asylum system is creaking with backlogs and the Home Office still refuses, even with public support, to allow asylum seekers the right to work after six months. And a fairer and compassionate relevant Home Office needs to work on the basis of a cross Whitehall strategy, developing a migration system that works for all. A system that also works in the best interest of children, including perhaps looking at child guardianship models. A Labour government needs to manage migration and asylum system properly recognizing that it's simply not humane, cost-effective, or in anyone's interest to make vulnerable people and people separated from families wait for extended periods for a decision without any real certainty. And we need more investment in the Home Office, or alternatively, and perhaps controversially, remove some responsibility from it. Trying to implement the EU settled status scheme, a points-based system, and overhaul the asylum system all at the same time is causing a massive backlog and what we would quite simply say impossible to do. A recent report from the APPG Migration stated that the UK economy is at a crossroads. It deals with unprecedented shock and combined with serious challenge. The Labour's future immigration system needs to ensure that immigration rules are considered as part of a wider context for skill and success in key industry. It needs to be modern, flexible and adaptable. And the world has moved towards flexible working, but the immigration system has not. It doesn't benefit the self-employed or any of the people that we really need. I want to move globally now, and global migration should not be weaponized. We've seen it over the press. We've seen it in countries like Belarus in Europe. Instead, we have to work globally together on systems that are humane, fair, and honor the Refugee Convention and our international obligations. They should also honor our commitment to aid and stability and our growth through overseas development. It is not simply good enough to keep having panics about global crisis while cutting aid and stabilization programs around the world. Nor is it good enough to ask other countries who already take the vast number of refugees to increase that number whilst we keep shirking our responsibility and our global commitment. We need to work together rather than leaking fake news headlines only to be dismissed the next day, as in the case of the ludicrous plans by this government to offshore asylum seekers in Albania, Rwanda and Ghana. Now on safe and regular routes, and I'll quickly finish on this as well, but it is not illegal to claim asylum. It's certainly not illegal to claim asylum via the means of arrival. And it's not necessary to claim asylum in the first country that you arrive at. And we have to challenge that narrative. We have no formal refugee visa program. Resettlement only makes up a very small part of those who come and should be expanded, as should other routes, which could include, as we have been heard, family reunion and humanitarian visas. 
Nobody wants people making unsafe journeys, and we definitely don't want people having to use people traffickers. Yesterday, we heard of a channel fatality, again, one of the first of the years. We have to stop this, but chucking money at so-called pull factors will not solve this issue. The question is, do we actually believe in the right to claim asylum anymore? Do we believe in the refugee convention that we helped create? Do we believe in international law and to work for a fair and safe system? Labour should offer more routes which break the very back of smugglers, not just by control, but by sustaining and expanding safe routes like resettlement, like humanitarian visas and certainty look at shared agreements. And to end, when elected, it is likely a Labour government will inherit a Home Office that is quite simply not fit for purpose. It requires a structural solution in the manifesto rather than repeating lines of reduction in so-called pull factors. Labour shouldn't run scared of migration. It needs to build and develop a bold narrative that reflects the country we are and we can be. A narrative where compassion and a functioning system is not seen as weak, but as ethical, law-abiding and good value. We need to be secure, yes, but we also should be big on humanity. Thank you. Thank you to all four of our speakers who I think have laid out a really good uh, opening set of arguments for our discussion this afternoon. We've got about 25 minutes for your comments and contributions. Um, so um, perhaps if people would like to stick your hands up in the air um, and I can pick some. I'd really love to start with a woman. So I'm hoping, I'm not my glasses on, I'm hoping I'm starting with a woman over there. Then I'll take the gentleman <laughs> down at the front. And then can I see some more hands on gentleman over there and then we'll do another round. Thank you. I wanted to ask about um, a safe route for undocumented people who are here now. I've been part of a local campaign to try and get our local MP, Ian Duncan Smith, to agree <laughs> to <love> this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to ask those who are not MPs, can the Labour Party, and those who are MPs, are, are Labour MPs, will the Labour Party commit to a clear, easy, safe, free route to settle status for undocumented people? Thank you. Great. And then we had a um, gentleman down at the front. One suggestion for a, a narrative of Labour policy in this area would be that Tory immigration policy is about lost opportunities. Um, it's about lost opportunities for your children to go and work on the continent, for you know, our job in Ibiza or whatever. It's about lost opportunities for your children to bring their spouse to come and live with them, unless they happen to be earning £80,000 a year. Um, it's about lost opportunities for your neighbour to apply to be a British citizen without paying some ludicrously high fees, um, which means that a lot of people can't afford it. Um, so that seems to me to be an arching narrative in which to place a labour narrative about uh, immigration. Um, and some policy, but one, we've heard about structural defects in the home, uh, home office. One thing I think should be seriously considered is whether simply to strip the home office responsibility of immigration and to transfer it to a, an economic department that focuses on opportunities rather than on uh, migration control. Thank you very much. And then there was the gentleman um, in the middle there. And then I'll come round again for a second set. Thanks very much. I'd just like to perhaps touch on a personal thing. My grandchildren are British citizens, but uh, they can't really come to this country because their mother doesn't speak English. And it just seems to me an extraordinary situation uh, that uh, British citizens are, are dealt with in this fashion. A second point I'd like to make is just on the immigration department itself, or the border forces is now called. Um, whenever I've had any contact with it, they seem to be unbelievably difficult and, try, and, and seem to treat everybody as a suspect and, and subject to the most fierce questioning and unpleasant practices. And there's just a culture there which is, which is thoroughly, just thoroughly unsatisfactory. Uh, and I, I suppose the third point, which I think, and to some extent this relates to the second point, the legal system around immigration is unbelievably complex. I think a judge actually said that it is more complex than the average lawyer can understand. And, um, uh, you know, the, 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 I, 
when one looks at this, there's such a huge range of things that need to be done. It's difficult to know where to start, but trying to simplify the system, trying to be a little more humane, trying to make, uh, trying to, trying to uh, simplify the legal system seem to be three big priorities that uh, need to be tackled. Thank you very much indeed, sir. I think you put your finger on it when you say where to start when we are looking at such a landscape of chaos, cruelty, and incompetence. Um, so we've got really three excellent questions that actually encompass about 10 different issues. Um, settled status for undocumented migrants who are already here, um, the narrative of lost opportunities, the fact that um, families are de facto prevented from being together in this country, the um, complexity of the system, and of course so much of it is done through immigration rules, not through primary legislation, um, and um, our repeat theme of the um, structural deficiencies and cultural deficiencies of the Home Office and whether it should be responsible for this area of policy at all. Ambas, can I start with you to answer any or all of those that take your fancy? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll try and answer uh, all three if I can. The first one, um, the, uh, the undocumented um, um, people, uh, you're absolutely right, that it's unbelievably complicated for people who um, are undocumented to um, become citizens. Um, but the 10-year route that is currently available uh, is just beyond their means, and also the fees are also a factor for that. Uh, I did a panel at the Labour Party conference um, uh, on this issue with uh, crisis, because what they found was that homelessness, on the course of homelessness, was that people were undocumented and were unable to access accommodation. So it's the 2014 Immigration Act. You can only be uh, legally given accommodation if you have the right status. Uh, now, clearly, that's if you don't have that status, you're not eligible for accommodation as well as other things. So that's one of the most you know, pernicious bits of legislation that has made problems worse. Um, and so these people are forced to live in the grey economy and uh, have difficulties accessing those uh, situations, but, uh, accessing um, the, the system again. So that's, and, and that needs to be addressed. So uh, certainly I'd very much welcome uh, quicker routes uh, for people that are undocumented. Clearly if people are here illegally um, and have come in illegally, then that's a separate matter. But people that whose leave remain expired and they couldn't afford the fee, or had some other reason why they were undocumented, that needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed in a very humane way that's uh, easy for them to access and get back into the system. So I'd very much welcome that and I would certainly be pushing for, for that to happen. Um, on the issue about the um, um, lost opportunity about accessing, um, it, it's part of the whole narrative because I think it's, um, I think the, the Again, this was an issue with, uh, there was a real divide with Brexit because young people can actually see the benefits of um, their future being denied to them by uh, a much older generation who bought into the narrative about taking back control and controlling our borders. Well, our borders aren't being well uh, effectively policed anyway, so that's something we can throw back. But I do think that post-Brexit, uh, when we do look back at what, we, what we've lost, I think there will be more reflection, and I think that is something that we do need to look at and we need to pull back to the narrative of any uh, manifesto commitments that we have. Uh, on the issue about uh, outsourcing the um, um, the asylum system, um, with that, I do have some reservations with that because partly what uh, the 2014 Act did was it outsourced um, the policing of, um, uh, of people's immigration status to landlords, to employers, to other people. So basically, it, it, they they made the job easy for border force, whoever was left at border force, uh, because it made put the onus on employers and landlords. So I, I would have some reservations for that, but we do need to have a, a very efficient, effective um, way of dealing with applications. It, it is absolutely scandalous um, that things, as, as you mentioned about your um, the, the mother of the, is it your uh, grandchildren? Uh, uh, not being able to come to the UK because uh, she doesn't speak English. Um, I, I've got situations with people who are in Afghanistan. I've got um, I've got somebody who's uh, a decision of mine. Uh, he got his immigration status. He's a British citizen. His children uh, are uh, British citizens. His wife isn't, and his eldest daughter isn't. So he'd get his um, half his family to the UK, but uh, the others can't. And and that's just a a stupid anomaly that the system needs to be addressed. 
and hopefully with better family reunion that would be addressed. Thank you very much, Bambus. Um, Heather, many are all. <laughs> I'll definitely take the, the opportunity. I think often we see migration, particularly the Brexit, from what has been done to other people, other people coming, rather than actually the loss. And I'll bring in a personal narrative, I may of this. But I grew up in, in Nottinghamshire, so Middle England, <laughs> Brexit, very um, you know, council estate area i would not have had the opportunity in my life without the ability to have traveled to have studied that freedom of movement gave me we quite simply couldn't have afforded it as a family um, you know i do work in the, in the balkans quite regularly over in croatia and again i, I can do that well, i could have done that when we were in the european union um, i also play with face and often we get short notice phone calls to say would you go and play you know this gig in germany uh, for a faith group dead easy now much much harder and um, and i really feel for that loss of people that just don't have the, the fortunate ability to be able to do that or can afford to do that or to navigate visa rules i mean even looking at things like you know electronic um waivers coming in sure it's about what seven euros i think they said but you know how many of us are okay navigating a full screen of kind of visa requirements and everything else it was just much easier. So I think some of the opportunity narrative also needs to be turned on its head a little bit to say it also affects us. It affects people I know that have gone and moved and studied. It affected me when that wall was put up effectively to say what I can and can't do. And equally it affects people I know and love who want to come here and who work and gained opportunity because of that. Um, I have friends you know, who want to come here, but actually it's incredibly expensive, it's incredibly difficult, it's really hard, it takes a long process to actually even apply for a visit visa, <laughs> you know, and it's, you know, it is expensive to do that. So the whole thing needs to be simplified and we need to be much bolder in, in talking about that. And just, I think, in just bringing on Bamba's point, I think as well about immigration rules and just how complex things are, and again, with families, does need to be simplified. You can't expect people to always have to go and trust that they found the right lawyer who happens to be cheap enough in your price bracket to, to go through that you then may or may not have ticked the right box. And what happens if the computer says no? You know, it, it's incredibly heartbreaking to have to go through that where people are, are separated. And we do live, whether we like it or not, in a global world where many of us have friends and families overseas that we do want to be able to be with, that we do want to be able to travel. And of course, you want to do that in the right way. But equally, you know, I think it should be a lot simpler and a lot cheaper. Thanks, Heather. Um, can we go to, on screen to see if we can get Amreen for her comments? Yeah, so um, uh, just to address the the um, question around safe routes for people that are already in the UK and um, don't have um, immigration status. So we know that because of the hostile environment and because of the fact that people aren't able to easily obtain indefinitely to remain so they only um, they might have status for maybe a couple of years um, and then they they might lose their status um, and then be subject to a hostile environment. So in essence, a lot of people that don't get indefinite leave to remain can um, be in limbo. Um, they can fall in and out of status. And if you don't have access to jobs, if you don't have access to, to decent housing or even healthcare in some instances, it makes your life incredibly difficult. And um, the, the our immigration system is intentionally um, overly bureaucratic. It's intentionally meant to put people off, um, which is, um, which is cruel, uh, simply put. Um, so that's why um, at IPPR we have proposed, um, we have thought about different ways that um, routes can be simplified for people that are already in the UK but just need to obtain their status. So for example, people that have been um, uh, living in, in the UK for long periods of time but still haven't managed to uh, obtain their status, they could um, potentially uh, become regularised on the basis of private life. And that means that they should automatically get indefinite leave to remain rather than limited leave to remain. Um, and that would simplify the system for people without immigration status and remove the need for repeated applications and fees under the 10-year route. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, the vulnerable situation route, which would provide indefinite leave to 
to remain for people in particularly vulnerable situations. So that includes people subjected to or at risk of abuse and exploitation and people with even serious physical or mental health issues. Um, the eligibility would be designed to include victims of trafficking and modern slavery and victims of domestic violence. And that would ensure that people that are in certain vulnerable circumstances would be able to access the support they need. Ultimately, this is all to say that that routes must be simplified because if not, people will just continue to fall in and out of status. Um, people's lives, um, you know, that if, for example, if you're on a work visa and you lose your job, that can make you subjected to the hostile environment. People's lives are complex and you, and if, if your life is complex and, and the immigration system is complex, then it puts you at serious risk of becoming subjected to the hostile environment. Um, so these are just some of the things that we've explored at IPPR. And I know that, that, that someone mentioned the, the um, idea of, of stripping the Home Office of its responsibilities around immigration. And there has been a lot of debate around this, like whether the Home Office should simply be abolished and, you know, whether, whether powers should be significantly reduced. Um, the, I'm not sure how uh, what my view is on this, to be honest, whether I feel strongly either way, because there is the counter argument that if you get rid of all the powers of immigration from the Home Office, then it could just end up in another department or a new department is created. And maybe it's more about the culture and maybe it's more about um, the government asking serious questions about what how we view immigration. What does immigration mean to the people of the UK? Is it just about um, plugging the gap when there are labor shortages um are we taking our international commitments to to responding to humanitarian crises seriously um what is it that immigration um what should immigration mean to us how how does it so uh, economically socially benefit us but also um you know what is our commitment to to the wider world when it comes to migration movements so i think questions like that need to be seriously thought about but also as i mentioned before we need to think about culture change um there is there are a lot of discriminatory practices that are deeply embedded within the home office and we saw we see that with the hostile environment we've seen that with the windrush scandal and preeti patel has promised um a compassionate system as heather mentioned earlier um but um i would agree with heather her version um her version of compassion might be different to, to other people's um concept of what compassionate is and the reality is we need to make sure that that any policies that are created and any decisions that are being made um as i mentioned before they need to be evidence-based and that doesn't it doesn't seem like that's happening enough in in the home office they they're continuing to push for deterrent tactics even though there is so much evidence to show that they just don't work um and and it's unclear how much involvement they're getting in terms of consulting um, people with direct experience of migration. So if if there was more of that happening, there would be more accountability mechanisms. There'd be more scrutiny of how decisions are being made, and that would make the that would change the culture within the Home Office. It would root out any racial uh, discriminatory uh, practices. It would make the the system, our immigration system, more compassionate, and and the Home Office a more compassionate and reputable department. So. Um, that's just a few of my thoughts. Lovely, great, thanks. And um, Tom? Briefly. Yeah, because um, I'm keen to get another round in if I can. Yeah, I, I don't want to repeat uh, things that my panelists have said uh, that I mostly agree with. A couple extra points that I would probably flag is, uh, you know, I know about the indefinite leave to remain fees and citizenship fees and other fees because I paid them uh, myself. Uh, it might make me a bit uh, different from others. And of course, at my citizenship ceremony, uh, the song was sung to us by local school children. It's just the bare necessities, you know, as if you had nothing left <laughs> after you paid the fees to, 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 to get, in, get in the room. And you would think for eye-watering fees up to 900% more than the cost of administering some services, you think you'd have a world-class um, status. But, you know, I required, uh, you know, I took some legal advice before I went in to, to make my application and discovered that not everything on gov.uk was there in terms of what I needed to show to get my permanent residency. It was not all there, it was incomplete. And so there's a real issue with the amount of money that immigrants are paying um, for services where a surprising amount of that money is going outside the immigration services. If immigrants, you know, it would be great. I mean, people talk about abolishing home office, other types of things. I'm more in favor of an immigration service that is self-funded 
and self-subsisting because it already is with a lot of money going to other areas of the home office and beyond and where there should be some kind of notice you know welcome to this park partly paid uh, for by immigrant fees. Welcome to this bus <laughs> and these public transport services, partly paid for by immigrant fees from me and from <laughs> others. Um, so if you want the, the other kind of quick point I would say is uh, talking about the, the family situation. It is wrong when law-abiding British families are being broken up by immigration rules for what? To look tough or, or something like this? or in this kind of imagination that this is how it used to be, that everyone, all British citizens used to all speak English, which was not true uh, at the time of the Treaty of Union where other languages, Welsh, Scots, Gaelic, others had equivalency with English. There's something wrong with that. And I think, um, so I think that's something that is kind of very troubling when the law is separating law abiding British citizens, you don't see this in other countries. Um, it shouldn't be happening here. And finally, on the complexity of legal rules, for those who know these kinds of things, this is where I show myself to be a professor. Uh, Plato's complete works is about 1800 pages. The immigration uh, statutes on the books and rules are uh, over 2100 uh, pages. There's something kind of, and, and whatever the inconsistencies one can find, in Plato's complete work, see me afterwards to discuss, uh, you know, at least some of them are explainable. Um, whereas this just seems to be utter incompetence. And the Immigration um, Act, for example, 1971, now looks like Frankenstein. It's kind of lots of packed stuff taken in as, as, as these acts seem to be coming almost uh, every year. Um, and it's, I think that's the, making things more simplified has been when the Law Commission recently um, uh, put forward a, a consultation on how this could happen. I was part of the consultation, government accepted it. It was basically just saying the rules should all be numbered the same way and should be the kind of say, well, that would be a kind of a, a massive step forward. Um, we need to go a lot further than that. Because if, if, if lawyers can't understand things, worse, if the home office can't understand the rules, that's why there's so many problems for folks claiming asylum, is the home office getting it wrong, then, then the rest of us are doomed. Very true, Tom. Right. So we've got about um, seven minutes left, and I can see two questions. So I'm going to take those two, and then three. three. Okay, you're going to have to be really quick. So it's one, two, three. Um, starting in in the back there. Kate's just bringing the microphone. Let's get up for this. Um, some of the um, Barnabas, tell me your um, things about immigration. Presume me. It's, they're basically telling the immigrants that we only want them to be some sort of slave army almost. I was at a pride event a few years ago, way, way before the pandemic, and I was discussing immigration with someone. Um, and we basically, we had this point of, we only really want low paid workers to do jobs and other British workers don't want. What message are we actually sending out? I've got my points, I'll try and be quick. Um, I, I have a Think of where people cross the channel because that's really dangerous. I used to do water sports, sports, so I know the channel is a terrible place for water sports. It's really rough and dangerous sea. So maybe um, we can have a think at British embassies or camps where people where uh, camps in, in sort of nearby neighbouring countries where people at the way people places people have fled, where people could apply for asylum there and then be taken over to stop also to stop the dangerous channels crosses and it also stop the so-called jungle camps at Fox, which are terrible to scribe. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I'm sorry it's a bit running around, but in the um, balcony up there, um, and as the other questions down in the middle, you can skip around over there okay. with that mic. <laughs> you just keep your hand up. Yes, the gentleman there. But we'll take the one on the balcony first. Hi, my name is Adam. I'm a member of the Armed Forces, and I work with a lot of people that um, come from the Commonwealth, um, that come over to the UK and serve in operations abroad, near, near and abroad as well. And one of the biggest things I see that they discuss is immigration and coming into the UK and the challenges that they have to go through, um, particularly people that have served in Afghanistan, look to remain and, and then 
pay huge fees to try and stay. Is there anything that is being discussed or talked about within the Labour Party about making changes to that? In particular, um, the Gurkhas is a, is a prime topic as an example. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And then down in the middle there. Thank you very much. Um, my name is George Byrne. I just want, first of all, to thank the four speakers who've been absolutely excellent and inspiring, um, all of them. Um, a couple of points, some very interesting uh, points have been made around narrative. And I think, you know, this is a difficult topic. It has been for a long time for people on the left to talk um, in, in, in what's deemed to be an acceptable fashion. I do think with the demographic trends that operate in the world, we see today with the aging of North America, of Europe and East Asia, there is, there is, and this picks up on a point that Bambos made, there is something to be said for talking about this in terms of a competition it's not that we should be resisting migrants. We should be competing for them. We should be. We, should, we th these are people we need. You know, at all levels of society. And I think that the, the way we talk about it, we can usefully move forward and start talking much more confidently in those terms. So that's 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 an observation. My other um, point is more of a question, but on a relatively small point. One of the things that I think is really embarrassing and shameful about this country is that we've created. A, a, a money laundering paradise. We, we've, we've created the environment for people who frankly steal money from, from, from a, a large range of countries to come here and protect to, with their ill-gotten gains and, um, and, and, and salt them away here. I know this because I'm a commercial lawyer. I, do, I see these people, some of these people, I'm sorry to say, are my clients, but I know that they're there. But I know one of the reasons that they're here is because they can use the golden visa scheme and I, I know that there was a tightening up of the golden visa scheme, but I wonder, and I'm probably looking most at Bambos on this, but it could be any, any of the speakers who talk about this, whether there is further justification and scope for looking at tightening it, improving it, uh, making it more robust, um, or even abolishing it. Um, and I appreciate the, de the, the, the debate around what that might mean for it, attracting investment might be a bit unhelpful. So, but, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's a topic I, I care about. Thank you ever so much. Right, so we've got four minutes left in this session, so I'm going to ask each of my four panellists um, to make one final point, lasting one minute each, uh, and I'm going to begin with Anreen on the screen, please, if we could start. Yeah, I'll do my best to keep it super brief. Um, I think I'll touch on on the narrative. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's important that the that we value the people that come into our country. And I also think that um, another narrative that really needs to be really mainstreamed is the fact that any policies that are pushed by the by the Home Office, they don't work for anyone, actually. They don't work for, um, obviously, the migrants. Um, they don't work for the Home Office because the because the, the policies fail most of the time, but they, they don't achieve the, the aims that, they, that they're that they are set out to do, um, but it also doesn't just work. It doesn't work for the wider public either. So I think um, there needs to be a, a definitely a, a narrative shift, and we need to really focus on you know the value of 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 people coming into the country, but also looking at how um, how uh, the Home Office's policies simply are ineffective and and don't work for anyone. They, they don't work for anyone. So that that's just one point I want to make. Um, and then in terms of one point, Amory. Oh, you sorry. Yeah, I'll just leave. I'll leave it at that point then. <laughs> Tom, Thank you. from you, please. One point only. Uh, speaking uh, about the military and the Commonwealth, you know, in our post-Brexit situation, the Commonwealth is something of, uh, of, of a blessing for us and something that I think uh, that we should be kind of doing more with. When you think about members of the countries in the Commonwealth uh, today are many of the top 10 countries as it were, sending citizens to, to live, work, and remain uh, here in many cases. Whereas in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, they held the same passport as any citizen in this country. And that equality has eroded. And I think it's, it's something that there are strong historical cultural ties that should be uh, brought back together. And the, that point about the, the military, those who have served absolutely should, have, should not be paying the same premium fee in order to reside. There's many different ways of thinking about citizenship and permanent residency. One is, say, a link, a birthright link. Another is thinking about um, uh, some tied to the land. Uh, but a third is through blood, through, through military service. 
And I think that military service is something the Labour Party can and should be honoring more and showing our dedication to this country um, that the Conservatives have failed to do. Thank you very much, Tom. Heather. Yeah, just a, a really quick one on, on the issue about people applying for my asylum outside. I think it came to a head during Afghanistan where a number of people were saying, why can't people just apply from a, from a country near Afghanistan, Pakistan, places like this? Um, and it's led to conversations around humanitarian visas, the practicality of this, what does it mean? What about the security aspects? It's not always quite as clear cut as just going to a, another country's embassy and applying for asylum there. What does that mean, particularly in cases of religious persecution, for example, or having to get there? Um, one of the, the ways that have been looked at, and amendment went through about this in the Nationality Borders Bill, was around the humanitarian visa making use of a border anomaly in Calais which we share with the French, to say actually could people be processed in Calais, apply for a humanitarian visa on the same grounds of an application to asylum, be processed there, then come to the UK and go through the system. So it would thereby take the power out of the smuggler's hand, give somebody safe passage in a sense to come um, under our existing system that we have. I uh, appreciate the practicalities of that. It takes a lot of effort to get through, but it certainly is something that's being talked about. Um, and I think a lot more people are putting some bit more effort into this and designing a safe route. Thank you very much. And finally, Bambos, you get to not only have the last word, but to try to bring together Labour's policy in this area um, <laughs> so that we can deliver a report back after this conference. <laughs> okay, well, just very quickly, on the point of the armed forces, Commonwealth uh, visas, this is a, a policy that we uh, we had a, an amendment a report stage of the Borders Bill that um, was pushed. We, we, we supported it. It's the front bench position. We very much welcome that people would certainly the, the armed forces be able to get visas uh, and uh, for a fee waiver if they've served uh, 10 years in our armed services. So that's policies, that's quite an easy one. Uh, and on the issue about people having the golden visa scheme for people that have got uh, abundance of wealth who want to invest in this country, there is uh, there, there are serious concerns about um, how some people with huge wealth have been able to come to the UK uh, and there's questions about where that wealth has come from. Uh, so certainly we would want to look at that in relation to the magnitsky scheme as well uh, and whether there needs to be tightening of this um, wealth from um, overseas. So that's what we would certainly be, be looking at. Thank you. I want to say an enormous thank you to all four of our amazing panellists and to actually an amazingly well-informed audience as well. Um, I think what we've heard in the last hour is just how very broad and complex this policy area is. And um, I think it definitely merits um, very considerable time and effort in the Labour Party to develop not just the policies, and we've heard some really great ideas this afternoon, but the way in which we're going to talk about and engage with people um, on them. And we had some really interesting thoughts on that too today. So thank you all very much indeed for your participation. Uh, please don't leave this room because I think I'm right saying that the next session <laughs> and our next two speakers, Absolutely. our, our interroga interrogator and um, our <laughs> responder are already in the room um, and it's going to be a fabulous Absolutely. session. So please stay to hear uh, Polly Twenby speaking to our shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Chair. <laughs>